for the job interview. Okay. So similarly, if we are doing a uh, negotiation with another company, we can do an uh, internet search. So it helps us our understanding of people, companies, and the industry. Can you find people on the internet? Are you on the internet? If I Google your name, will I find you? Hmm? So it depends on, well, you can find some people. Do you know LinkedIn? LinkedIn is where people put their resume. People also have Facebook accounts. Okay, people have Twitter, you know Twitter? So can you find out about people on the internet? Yes? Is that stalking? Hmm? No? So just before we negotiate with them, we can find out who we're negotiating with, we can check about their company and the industry. Other areas we can get information from, newspapers have the digital archive. Do you understand archive? Yes. Archive means in the past. We have an annual report of the company. 10K is official annual report. Analysts make reports on the companies. They can all give us a useful perspective. Do you understand perspective? Perspective means view. So it gives us an, an interesting, useful view on the person and the company and their, what the company wants, what does the company need. So we're talking about you know, using big, big negotiations where you're buying another company, okay, like joint venture, that kind of thing. So you want to find out about the interests of the other company. So you can look at the industry, find out Let's say you said something about Tesla. These days, the electric car industry is getting more important. Yes. Right? So if you're dealing with a company which is making parts for cars, then you find out that these days they're making more parts for the electric car industry. Then you can think about their, that that's their interest in the negotiation. You can make your product to be better used for electric cars because you're meeting their interests. So, we're talking about checking the interests. So, the next one is internal sources. If you're doing a negotiation with another company, it may be that somebody else in your company already had the experience of dealing with that company or that person. You understand internal? So we, here we have tap internal sources. Do you know tap? Uh -huh. Tap, like water. You can use the water, turn on the tap, right? So we turn on the tap of people in our company. So sources who have personal experience in dealing with our counterpart. So somebody else already had a negotiation with that company or person before. So who do we know that has already negotiated? with these people. Maybe they might be in your company. They might be one of your customers. Okay? Could be anybody. What do they know about the other person, the other parties? Concerns, preferences, and hot buttons. Hot buttons means you press the button, they are happy or not happy. So a friendly lunch can give a good insight. So just try to find somebody just imagine you're a new worker in a company and you have to negotiate with a Chinese company. But somebody from your company already negotiated with the Chinese company two years ago or three years ago, right? So you could just ignore that and you decide, I know best, I'm going to negotiate with the Chinese company by myself, okay? Or you could ask them to go for lunch. Are they going to say no if you ask them, can we go for lunch someday? person inside your company, will they say no? If you ask them for lunch? What do you think? They have lunch too. They will probably say yes, right? You can explain to them I'm doing, I have to make a contract with this Chinese company, right? So it doesn't have to be formal. Do you understand informal? Is a lunch formal or informal? Informal. Informal. So you don't have to tell them that they have to use up their work time. 
right? So they don't have to schedule a meeting. Just informally, you can ask them to go for lunch together, and you can pay for the lunch, and you can ask them some questions and find out about the other person, the other company in China. Okay? They can tell you about those things. That's all useful information that can help you to know about the interest of the other person. You can also tap the knowledgeable advisor, so some professionals like lawyers, accountants, investment bankers, or other industry consultants. So those people might have some experience of dealing with that person or some advice for you. So first of all, in the company you, can, you pay these people right, to help you. You pay the lawyers, pay the accountants, pay the bankers. Okay? So you can ask them about their experience. So if you ever have to use a lawyer, you don't have to be afraid. Some people are afraid of lawyers. Are you afraid of lawyers? Hmm? They think the lawyer is extremely well qualified and very smart person, so they're Hello. right? A little bit shy or afraid of the lawyers. But if you're working in the company, then the lawyer or the accountant is working for you. So you can ask them, do you have experience in this area or not? Okay, so generally that's a good idea. They might say, oh, try to avoid the question. Then you have to ask them specifically, how much experience do you have in this area exactly? Okay. So you can ask them in detail about their experience. And are they familiar with your negotiating counterpart? So did they already do a deal with them or not? Okay. If not, maybe you can hire another lawyer who has experience with, your, with dealing with Chinese companies, for example. Right? You're negotiating a deal with the Chinese company, and some lawyer is helping you, but they never did any work with, in China before. Okay? Then you're quite within your right to change to a different lawyer, okay? and find a lawyer who has that kind of experience. Then these people might be able to help you. You can ask them, who on the other side is more likely to be reasonable? Who is more likely to be unreasonable? What kinds of arguments are they receptive to? Okay. So these kind of people, they have confidentiality agreements. Do you understand confidentiality? Do you understand confidentiality? What does it mean, confidential? Can the lawyer, lawyers tell you the confidential information of their clients? What kind of confidential information would a lawyer have about their clients? Here is a lawyer. Okay? They have a client from China. Okay? And you are also going to be, you are also their client. Okay? <coughs> you want to make a deal with the Chinese company. Okay? So you ask your lawyer about the Chinese company. To help you. Okay? You ask them, who in the company is a reasonable person? Who's not reasonable? Do you understand reasonable? Who do you want to negotiate with? The reasonable person or the not reasonable person? The reasonable person. Okay? So you can find out that client's information. But can the lawyer tell you confidential information about their client from China? Yes. What's an example of confidential information? Personal information. Personal information, like what? They, they are the lawyer for this company. So what kind of confidential information do they know about this company? Dealing, dealing projects. With their projects, they're dealing with some projects, right? How much does the project cost? Okay, that kind of thing. They can't tell us that confidential information. But they can tell us some informal or not confidential information. Okay? Like that kind of question. Who is reasonable in the company? Who's not reasonable in the company? Okay? 
What kind of arguments do they usually accept? Do they like just the money? Or do they like another argument? Okay. So we can find out more information from these kind of people. Investment bankers. There are not many investment bankers. They often, investment bankers can deal with both companies. So again, how can we get them to tell us this kind of information? Just informal, not confidential information. Mm. How can we get the lawyer or the banker or accountant to tell us that kind of information? Have lunch. Have lunch, right? Or meet them, informal way. I'm just asking informally. We can meet them at the conference or we're doing some other business with them. You can ask them also about that. So then let's have an activity. So, can you sit up here? So, with your partner, you're going to do an arm wrestle. Do you understand the arm wrestle? So, if you want, you can move to a different desk. You put your arm on the desk, right? I'm going, if you touch the table with your partner's hand, you get one point. So, we're going to see how many points can you make in 15 seconds. Okay, so I'll get ready. I'm going to put on the timer. Okay, are you ready? Okay, here it is, just 15 seconds. Okay. How many times can you? Who can get the most points? How many times can you touch your partner's hand against the table? Okay, ready? Go! <laughs> Why didn't you cooperate to get more points? You didn't cooperate, you were competing. Why were you competing? Hmm? Why did you decide to compete against your partner? I should get the point. Well, if you let your partner put down your hand and you can let them put down your hand, then you can make a lot of points. Hmm? So well, some people can make 30 points in just 15 seconds. Do you understand? Yes. So this is a psychological. The next one we're going to talk about is, we'll talk about later in the class, but just for the moment, we'll talk about psychological traps. So the, this is fixed pie. So people claim to the perception of conflict. So you guys were doing conflict. So you thought that you're conflicting against each other, even when your interests are compatible. If you cooperated, then you both could have got very high points if you cooperated instead of doing the conflict. You guys only got one point because you were all the time in conflict, right? Yes. How did you get seven points? She's too weak. <laughs> or were you smart? You were letting her get more points? <laughs> hmm? Which was it? Smart or weak? Really weak. <laughs> Which? My arm is weak. My arm is weak. So, <clears throat> that's a psychological thing. People tend to think, ah, I have to compete or I have to conflict with the other person. But actually, you don't have to compete or conflict with the other person, right? So we have to get around that, that uh, barrier. We also have the self-serving role uh, bias. So it means that 
Uh, if I give you some document, and it's exactly the same document, for, the pri for a house, and you have to decide the price of the house, but I tell you you're selling the house and you're buying the house, and I ask you, what do you think the price should be? Who do you think is going to tell me a higher price? I give you exactly the same information about the house, okay? And I tell you that you're buying the house, and I tell you you're selling the house. Who do you think is going to have a higher price? Selling the house, right? Even though you've got exactly the same information, you have some, it's called self-serving role bias. So just, it's serving myself. Okay? If I have a higher price, it's better for me. If I have a higher, so you're not looking at the real situation about what the price should be. You're thinking just about your own side of the thing. Okay, so uh, the next one is partisan perception. Do you understand partisan? Partisan is you're favoring one side over the other side. So people also have this psychological issue. So if I have a fight with somebody, usually I, I think in my mind that I'm right and they're wrong, okay? But usually I exaggerate that they're very wrong and I exaggerate that I'm very right. So maybe the person didn't do such a bad thing, but in my mind, I think they're really bad and they did a really bad thing. I exaggerate what they did wrong. So partisan just means again that I think the other person is wrong and I'm right. Just, that's a psychological way that people think. They don't think just fairly all the time. Or they exaggerate uh, the problem. So, how can we counteract, work against this kind of psychological mechanism? So, just knowing, that these, knowing about these problems can help us in some situation. Okay? So just understanding that we usually want to think first about conflict or competing with the other side rather than cooperating. Okay? It can help us to understand that we need to think more about cooperating. Okay? Uh, for the second and third ones, we can seek the view of the outside uninvolved parties who are not caught up in the dynamic. So this is often the case in relationships. Right? People get counselling. Do you understand counselling? Yes. So, for example, the man and the woman is having a fight. Okay? And the, ma the man thinks the woman is very wrong and exaggerates that the woman is very wrong. And the woman thinks the man is very wrong and exaggerates the man is very wrong. So what can help is we have a counsellor who is in the middle. Okay? Then the counsellor tells the man, actually the woman is not that bad. Right? The counsellor tells the woman, actually the man is not that bad. Okay? So it helps us to understand that we have bias in our brain. Another good way is preparing the argument for the other side. So one lawyer, very experienced lawyer, he gave the junior lawyer a case to prefer, prepare. And he gave him all the information of the case. And he told him that you are going to defend. Do you understand the difference between defend and prosecute in law? What does the difference between defend and prosecute? For example, if we have a criminal, what does it mean the difference between defending the criminal and prosecuting the criminal? What's the difference? One lawyer is going to defend the criminal. Another lawyer is going to prosecute the criminal. What's the difference? Defend the lawyer defends criminal. What is the lawyer defending the criminal doing? Protecting, helping the criminal. What about the prosecutor? Let the criminal execute. 
That's a bit harsh. Be executed. Killed. Execute means killed. Right? <laughs> the prosecutor is saying why the criminal should go to jail, right? Yes. So they have the opposite sides. So the senior lawyer, he asked the junior lawyer to prepare to defend the criminal. He said, you're going to defend the criminal in this case. So the junior lawyer spent two days making a very detailed case to defend the criminal. Then guess what the senior lawyer told him the next day? I will prosecute. Yes, you don't have to defend, you have to prosecute. Right? You're not defending, you're prosecuting. But now that you've prepared the case from the point of view of defending the criminal, now you understand the case very well, and you don't have the bias. Do you understand bias? Do you understand bias? What does bias mean? Like a partisan. What does bias mean? Okay, so I like you, but I don't like you, right? I think you're a very good student, and I think you're a very bad student. So I get your test, I, I see your name, right? Ah, must be all correct. Very good, A plus, right? I get your test exactly the same, maybe essay, quality, ah, uh, bad student. C minus, right? That's bias. Do you think teachers are biased no. with the students? Mm -hmm. So anyway, because of the bias, they asked the lawyer to prepare the defense and then told him, no, you're doing the prosecution. Okay? So you can understand very well the case. So if we think about the argument from the other side, it can help us too to understand well. To stop this kind of psychological mechanism problem. So, this concludes the part on interests. Do we have any question about the interests? We said, anything anybody cares about in the negotiation is an interest. We have to map our interests and their interests. Don't just focus on price, think about other interests. Okay? Ask, listen and probe to find the person's interests. Use the public sources to find their interests. Use internal sources to find out about the other side. Use knowledgeable advisors. Be aware of our psychological issues. Right? So that sums up the interests. So let's move on to the last part of setting up for the negotiation. That is chapter 7 in the book. is sequence and process. What does sequence mean? If things are in sequence, what does it mean? So put these, put these numbers in sequence. So oh, put the numbers in sequence. Two, the correct four, sequence. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six. Eight, ten. Okay, that is the correct sequence. Okay, putting things in sequence means putting them in the correct order. How should we do the things correctly? So, an example here is there was a Mexican or a US company. They want to buy a Mexican company. There are three Mexican companies. Big company A, medium company B, and small company C. So the US company, first they tried, it was an engineering company. So in engineering, the way people think is, let's try the best one first. And then if that doesn't work, try the next best one. So the engineering company started off with negotiating with company A, the biggest one. But it didn't, do, didn't go very well. Okay? The negotiation didn't go very well. They didn't respect the Mexican culture. In Mexico, they value the relationship. In the US, they don't value the relationship as much. In Mexico, they have high power distance. So they want to meet the CEO or the high executives 
in the US they don't have a high power in distance, so they just sent the low level engineers to the negotiation. So they had some problems with the company A. So they couldn't make an agreement and they had a fight. So then they went to company B. This time they did the cultural things correctly. They made a relationship, they did slowly, they sent the high level people. Okay? But still they couldn't, they were having some problems with company B. Okay? So then their only choice is to go to company C. And now they have to pay a very high price for company C. Because they had a fight with these guys, so now they have no choice. Okay? Do you, can you suggest a better way or sequence for the US company to make this negotiation? What? See, contact the C company mm -hmm. and contract this option and if they... But I don't want the C company, I want the A company. This is the best one. So you're going to contact the C company? Yes. What if they say yes? Uh, if they want M&A, then I suggest highest option. So you, you suggest a too high option for them? Yes. And then what? Uh, make a profit of high. So you C says no then because you said too high price. What are you going to do next? Contract A and B together. Yeah, so we do some parallel negotiation. We can contact all of the companies okay? together. Or we can contact the B and C. And one way that we do that, if we can't, what they did is they contacted B and C, they start negotiation with both of them together, then what is A going to do? If A knows, A is going to know that I'm negotiating with B and C about taking over their company, then what is A going to do? A contacted the US company. Yes, then A contacted the US company for some negotiation, right? So you can see, they get jealous. Do you understand jealous? They get jealous uh -huh. because you're, they're giving the attention to these other ones, right? Then they start to approach the A, right? Girls, do you use this strategy sometimes, if you have a guy you like? <laughs> no? Here's a guy that you like, but he's not showing any interest. So then you get show some interest in the other guy, and then he gets jealous, <laughs> then he starts to show some interest. No? You can use it now, right? After this class. <laughs> the tactic, right? A sequence, sequence way, right? So the sequence can also matter. So we have three things we're going to talk about, about the sequence. So we are going to scan widely to map the range of potential par parties as well as the relationships. We're going to talk about mapping backwards from the target uh, to the current situation and carefully orchestrating the stages of reaching the target. Do you understand orchestrating? <laughs> Orchestra, right? So we're going to plan and maneuver the different stages of reaching the target. Okay? So should it be public or private? Should it be separated or together? So let's talk about each one. So first, scanning widely. So we mentioned this before in parties. We have to think of a value net, which may extend beyond the people who are in the negotiation currently. So value net means anybody who is affected by the negotiation or who could be affected. So like stakeholders in the negotiation, right? So the question we're asking is who outside the negotiation might value some part of the deal? For example, who might minimize the cost of production, distribution, risk sharing, who might supply a piece that's missing? Okay, well, how can we bring these parties and issues together into the deal? <coughs> so, sometimes people, the answer to who should we contact first is obvious. 
But in more complex situations, it often helps to focus on another target and map backwards from that target. So we're going to look at an example of an uh, internet TV company. Do you have inter internet on your TV in Korea? Uh, sometimes. Hmm? sometimes. Can you use the internet on your TV? In the US they have a service called Netflix. Yes. And you can use the internet on your TV. So just their start, this guy was starting, this was called Web TV. They were starting their company. So they made this mapping of all the parties who are in the deal. So they have already they're negotiating with these people. Do you understand seed financing? Yes. What's that? What? Yeah, so they're just a startup company. He's, this is just a startup company. So seed financing is people who's giving the money for the seeds, for the company starting up. They have the concept, prototype, and development, so they're just developing their concept. They are recruiting their staff, building their management team. These are the kinds of things they're doing. So then there's other parties with whom we can make deals. Internet service providers, electronics firms, okay? uh, manufacturing agreements, wholesale distributors. Here we have getting money, venture capitalists, angel investors, industrial partners, others. Okay? Partnerships with other content providers. So what would be the most obvious thing to do here? You're a startup company, you have an idea, you're, doing, you're trying to get some seed financing, you're just hiring staff and building a team. So what would seem like the most obvious first step here? Who would you approach to make a deal with? Yeah, so that's the most obvious one. We don't have much money, we have no money now, we're just a startup company. Okay. So it seems obvious that the first thing I should do is go to the angel investors or venture capitalists, right? But that's not what they did in this case. Okay, they took a different sequence. Because when they went to these guys, they weren't that interested in their company. And they didn't give a good price. Very, they asked them, like, you have to give me 50% of your company and I'll give you just low price. So they were giving a very bad deal. So what do you think they could do then instead? They're getting a very bad deal from these guys. So for the young company, usually the bank is not going to give a lot of money, right? It's too risky. So they have to try and find money somewhere else. So you said, first step, find money, right? They don't have any money. Seems obvious, but no luck finding money. So what, what should their first step be then, if it's not finding money? Just option in this or another? Yeah, the answer is on here. Um, One of these other parties with whom they can make a deal. What other party would you choose to make a deal with? Partner with consumer Yes, so they made a partnership with TV companies like Sony or Philips. They approached Sony or Philips with their idea. Right? They said to Sony, we have this idea of Internet TV. Okay, we have this company and this idea. Are you interested in working with us together? Sony said no. So then they went to Philips. Do you know Philips? Yes. And Philips said yes. So then because Philips said yes, two things happened. Just like this one here, Sony wanted to start negotiating again. When Sony heard that Philips said yes, they wanted to start negotiating again. Okay? And then secondly, these guys were more interested in the company because they had a partnership with Philips and they decided to pay more money and they were able to get funding at a much better deal. So the normal sequence was just look for funding. But they changed the sequence. They, they made a map of all the people and they decided to start with the end, the very last target, which is the, the TV companies who can TV company who can make the internet TV, right? Uh, make the electronics that allows you to use the internet on the TV. So they made a kind of partnership with a big name, and then because they had a partnership with a big name, then they got more funding. 
or got much better deal on the funding. So, can you understand this example? Yes. So this is from mapping, scanning widely, making a list of all, this company made a list of all of the people who could be, who they could make a deal with, or who's interested in their company. And then, instead of going to the most obvious one, they went to the end one, the last one, and then came back to these guys and got a better deal. So the sequence can matter when we're making a negotiation. Do you have any question about that example? No. No? If you start the company, <laughs> could you do that too? It's not easy, right, starting a company. It's not easy to approach and meet all of these companies, but uh, if you have a good idea, then it's possible. So, as you scan for the sequencing purpose, you also have to pay attention to the relationship along, among the players you'll be dealing with. The most common problem is that the most critical party can be the most difficult to approach. Do you understand critical? What's another word for critical? Another word in English for critical? Very important, right? So the most important party might be the most difficult to approach. So you might want to approach Philips or Sony, but they might not be interested or it's hard to approach them. So that's a common problem. So. We have to try, we're going to talk about backward mapping, but we have to f try and find somebody who knows somebody who knows them, or who can get to them. So, do you know President Clinton? No. President Clinton was president in the US in the 90s, quite a popular president in the US, because the US economy did very well at that time, it's an IT boom. So, he was trying to get approval for the North American Free Trade Agreement. Do you know NAFTA? Yes. What is NAFTA? Okay, for goods and services. There's no tax. So they were having trouble because people were voting against, even people in their own party was voting against the NAFTA. So their problem is how can they approach them? So this guy was the strategist for Bill Clinton and he said we have to make more calls and in specific directions. He says, can we find a guy who can deliver the guy? We have to call the guy who calls the guy who calls the guy. Can you understand that phrase? So they, they, want, they, they want to get this politician to change his mind from he's saying no, they want to change the yes. But they can't approach him directly. Okay, so they want to call another guy who calls another guy, how many? Who calls this guy, right? Do you understand? Yes. And then he changed his mind. So that's one way they're thinking about how can we approach these people. First we approach this person we know, maybe they're in the same party, the same party, so they know this person. This person is very good friends with him, okay? This person is very good friends with him, and I'm good friends with this person. So I'll call them, then they will call him, he calls and then he calls him, tries to convince him to change his mind to vote yes with some argument. Whereas if I just talk to him, he won't accept my approach. Doesn't accept my approach. So, uh, backward mapping. Uh, do, did you watch the news recently about the UN? They made some new sustainable development goals called SDGs for the world, like improving the education, improving the health care, getting rid of malaria. Yes. When the UN does this kind of thing, they do backward mapping. So they start in 2030. They say by 2030, okay, we want to get 95% of children in education. Okay? They already did this for the Millennium Development Goals. For the MDGs, they wanted to reduce poverty by 50%. Do you understand poverty? Uh, yeah. 
So they were able to do that. They did some backward mapping using the backward mapping. So backward mapping, they make a target. We make a, our target. This is what we want. Okay? And then we have to say, how do we get there? What steps do we need to follow? So you can also use backward mapping for your life. It's very useful. So where do you want to be in 20 years, in 30 years? People often ask you at the interview, right? In 10 years, I want to be a chief financial officer in a company. Then I do backward mapping. What do I need to do before that? I need to be the financial worker in the company. What do I need to do before that? Okay? I need to have the accountancy qualification. Okay? What do I need to do before that? I need to pass the accountancy exam. What do I need to do before that? I need to finish my degree and then study for the accountancy exam. So can you, do you understand the idea of backward mapping? Yes. For SDGs, they do this, right? What do we need to do here and here and here to get to this target? So we can do this like that company did, right? They started with their target and then they worked, what do we need, how do we get to the target? So start with the end point. Work back to the present to develop a timeline and a critical path. Okay, so that's your homework. I want you to make a timeline for your life for the next 10 years. So you have to do um, just practicing backward mapping. So this is 2015. So I want you to say, where do you want to be in 2025? And make a line. Timeline. Which year and um, doesn't have to be too detailed, right? So this is for you can write this down, it's your homework. Make a backward map for your life. Okay? Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> so you make this, then you focus in the negotiation, you focus on the most difficult to persuade player. So the most difficult to persuade player could be here at the end, or it could be here. So somebody who's very important to the deal, you figure out on the timeline. This person you want to have on board. So who do you need to have on board to negotiate with this person? So you figure out this is a critical person for me. Then you have to ask yourself, who is the guy that I can get to, so I can approach this person? And then even further, how are you going to get this party on board? How are you going to get this guy on board? Okay? So who knows this guy? What would make it easier for him or her to say yes? So keep continue mapping in this fashion. So just keep going if you have to. So you identify where your target, the end point of where you want to be. Then you find a critical person. And then you find the person who has the influence on the critical person. Another person who has influence on the critical person. And so that is uh, the backward mapping for the negotiation. Do you have any question about that? If timeline is one year, one year step by one year. You can do your timeline, can be anything. It can be five years, two years, one year, right? Well, you can identify some critical person then how can you get some influence on the critical person for your career? Okay. Do you know what you want to do in 10 years? Hmm? It doesn't have to be... If you write that down now for the homework, you don't have to do that. Right? You're not writing a contract. But just you can have a think about it and make some backward math. It's useful. So then let's uh, take a break now for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you have to write down your target. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Okay. And then you need to make a backward map. Go backwards from that. About what you need to do to be there. Okay.